morning, everyone. I just want to actually open in prayer, just tying in with what we just sang. Because no matter what you might be uh, in your life or even encountering this past week, uh, that song reminds us you can just come just as you are. No matter where you are, Jesus Christ, whether you're still searching, uh, whether you're a solid Christian, but you've been struggling a little bit with some doubts, you can come just as you are. So I just want to open up with that kind of prayer, and then I'm going to lead us into a couple of questions that I want some feedback on from you guys. You're already used to that. You've seen me do that before, so you're going to get your thinking caps on in a moment with a couple of questions to start off our time with learning from Acts chapter 17. <clears throat> Father, Son, Holy Spirit, Thank you that we can come just as we are before you now. We don't have to have all of our acts together. We don't have to be like this perfect, never done any mistakes, thought anything wrong before we can come before your throne room, our holy God. No, but because of our faith in Jesus Christ, we are made righteous. We are right before you and we can come just as we are before your throne room and you accept us. You open up your arms ready to embrace us. And I thank you for that beautiful gift, that beautiful gift of a relationship with our awesome and holy God, our creator, <clears throat> our father, Jesus, our friend and Savior. So Father, you know what every person is facing, whether in this room or watching online. You know what their week was like, even what their morning was like. It could have been that they woke up with a massive bounce in their step, and they're, they're, they're just filled with joy and a smile from ear to ear. But it could be others, Father, that woke up this morning and there's a heaviness upon them. Whether it be with school, whether it be with work, whether it be with family. Father, I just thank you. <clears throat> That no matter what, we can all gather together as one before you, and you receive us. <clears throat> and also, we know that this morning, wherever people are at, you want to minister to them. You are the promise keeper, the way maker. And so, Father, minister. Said. Amen. <clears throat> All right, ready? Put your thinking caps on. I'll ask you a couple of questions. And these are a little bit more thought-provoking, but what's the first thought that comes to your mind? Just feel free to shout it out. If we've got like five people shouting at the same time, I'll try to point and see so we can all hear clearly what you're saying. So here's the two questions. The first one is this. As you observe our society today, as you look out into the world, how would you describe it? Complicated, what? Despairing. Despairing, okay? Evil, darkness, okay? Lost, broken. Chaotic. Lots of positive things to say about our society, eh? <laughs> Was that? Confused, yeah. Lots of good words to describe as we look at our society today and as we look at our world today. Really, those words are appropriate. So here's my second question. Recognizing that reality that is out there in our society, how do you think that reality affects people in here? How does it affect their heart? How does it affect their mind? How does it affect them deep in their soul? Thoughts, how does it affect them? Ooh. Despair. Stress, anger. Okay. Anxiety, no hope, hopelessness, yeah, confused, <clears throat> sad, all right, sad, depressed, all right, great answers, thanks for your feedback. Let me explain to you why I did this exercise. Simply stated this, the best way to present the gospel, the good news of the gospel, is by understanding what people are um, searching for in here that they can't get from our world out there. What are they searching for? What are their longings? What are their needs in here that they're trying to get out there, but it keeps failing them? Or maybe they get it for a little while, but it's temporary at best. 
That's the best way to present the gospel when we have that understanding. And that's what the Apostle Paul did in Acts chapter 17. We find the Apostle Paul right now in Athens in his travel through Europe. Remember I had the map on the screen last week and he landed in Europe, went to Philippi first, and now he's going down south a little bit to Athens. And he finds himself in Athens and he brilliantly presents the gospel message in Athens after he took some time to observe the society and what was going on around the society in Athens and how it might have been impacting them or what they might have been thinking about, what their greatest needs or longing were in here and in here. And my desire is that after this message that we would all have a greater, not just understanding of the gospel, but more clearly, I want to share with you how we can have greater confidence in sharing the gospel in a way that helps people's needs be met in here. And there's four needs we're going to be looking at that every human being has, and we can revolve our gospel message, our chats with people around one of those four needs. Folks, this is going to be so good that at some point in my message, I'm going to actually challenge you to feel free to take your phones out and type up whatever good stuff I'm going to be sharing with you with regards to these four longings that every person has. If you have a pad and paper, get it out there. You're going to be wanting to write. Get your phones out there because you're going to want to remember these four things. They're absolutely brilliant. They're not my idea. They come from brilliant apologists apologists out there. Apologists are people who defend the faith, defend the Christian faith. So let's get going. As we read through Acts chapter 17, we're going to start in verse 16, and here's what I want you to process. Here's what I want you to think about. As we look at what's going on in society there in Athens, are there any similarities between first century Athens and our society today? And we're going to see many. Acts Verse 17, starting verse 16. While Paul was waiting for them in Athens, he was greatly distressed to see that the city was full of idols. That word distressed actually means he was infuriated. He roused him to anger. It irritated him. Get the picture of how this affected the Apostle Paul as he looked around society and all the fullness, all the idols. Verse 17, so he reasoned in the synagogue with both Jews and God-fearing Greeks, as well as in the marketplace day by day with those who happened to be there. A group of Epicurean and Stoic philosophers began to debate with him, and some of them asked, what is this babbler trying to say? Others remarked, he seems to be advocating foreign gods. They said this because Paul was preaching the good news about Jesus and the resurrection. Then they took him and brought him to the meeting of the Areopagus. Areopagus is both a location and a council of people. They brought him to the Areopagus where they said to him, May we know what this new teaching is that you're presenting. You're bringing some strange ideas to our ears and we'd like to know what they mean. I love this. All the Athenians and the foreigners who lived there spent their time doing nothing but talking about and listening to the latest ideas. Wow, there's so much to unpack here. And as we unpack it, you're going to see that there's so many similarities between the first century Athens and 21st century, our world today. And then we're going to look at how Paul presented the gospel to them because it's going to give us great wisdom and understanding how to present the gospel to our world today because there's so many similarities. First, we, are, we see that as he walked around, it says it's a city full of idols. It was said actually about Athens that there was more statues to gods just in that one city than all of Greece combined. Someone once said that you'd probably have greater chance of running into a god before you run to any people. <laughs> and they had all these statues, all these gods all around the city. Why? Because Paul recognized, and we recognize too, and I'll mention in a moment, that People have all these statues and gods because they're living in fear of them because they don't want to try to displease any of their gods uh, and make sure that all of them are honored and revered with these statues lest they displease them and lest they experience their wrath. They're just living in fear of all of these gods. My question is this, do we have idols in our world today? All kinds of different idols. In fact, there are religions out there that do have statues 
to their many gods. Hinduism has 33 different gods. One time, one of my apologetics professors, in fact, uh, from Tyndale Seminary, uh, Jim Beverly, he's a world-renowned expert on world religions. One time he took his class, anybody who wanted to join him, to go just walk through a Hindu temple and observe what is going on there. Then he brought the students together afterwards and said, let's debrief. What did you see? What did you experience? And all of them said some of the following things. They said, I didn't see any joy. In fact, I saw nothing but fear. I saw emptiness as I looked at them. Emptiness in their eyes, deep in their soul. And some of them would have even said that as we walked in there, I just sensed this overarching darkness. But all of them prostrating themselves before these gods for fear of them, not out of love or believing that they are. Then you have Islam. Wait a minute, Pastor Steve, Islam doesn't have many gods, they only have one God. Yes, <clears throat> they name him Allah. But I've witnessed to many Muslims. And you know, one time I asked them to question, I asked them several occasions this one question. Do you have assurance that your Allah will receive you in heaven? Do you have assurance, security that you are saved and you are right before your Allah? I remember one person actually said to me, no one does. I said, I do. No, you can't. There's no way. Yes, I do. Even Muslims live in fear, hoping, hoping that when they encounter their Allah, that they'll, this Allah will be pleased enough to welcome them in. Worshipping these different gods, these wrong gods, they, people live in fear. Or what about the reality that in our world today, there is the God of self. <laughs> the God of self. Meaning, I make up the rules as I see fit, that fits within my parameters, that makes sure that, in essence, I can find happiness at any cost. I'm the God of myself, or the self is God. Then there's the biggest idol out there. In fact, sometimes it infects Christians. Because with this idol, we place upon it a lot of our sense of security and peace of mind. Not only for the present, oh, but for the future as well. And that idol that sometimes we have, that we place so much security and hope and peace of mind on, is that of money. So I wonder if Paul, I wonder if Paul, if he walked around here in, in this city or in this region or around our world, if he would be just as distressed in the 21st century as he was in the 1st century. So how does Paul choose to respond to this crowd in Athens? Did you notice, remember, distress means irritated, infuriated, roused to anger within him. But then in verse 17, so he reasoned in the synagogue. He entered into dialogue, into discussions with him, with them. In other words, he internalized the anger in the irritation so that he can respond calmly. And in a moment, we're going to see very wisely and logically. Folks, these are, this is a great, great lesson to learn. You see, these people were willing to listen to Paul because he approached them in the way that they're going to receive what he's going to teach them. He reproached them with respect and with gentleness and calm, entering in discussions. He built a bridge between him and what he's about to teach them about the one true God and where they're at. And they met in the middle and they started talking and discussing because he didn't show his irritation, show his anger. There's a time and place for righteous anger. But folks, when we're given the opportunity to share the gospel with others, the Bible reminds us to do it with gentleness and respect. 1 Peter 3.15 Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect. Remember how a few weeks ago 
we looked at Saul's encounter with Jesus on the road to Damascus. And then Saul was um, re recounting that experience to his protege, Timothy. And he said to Timothy, because of my ignorance and unbelief, God had mercy upon me. And most people we witness to will probably be like the Saul. And so therefore, just as Jesus had mercy on Paul, may we have mercy in the way we talk about Jesus with others. Not getting angry or frustrated or defensive, but share it with gentleness and respect, having mercy. Now Saul encounters a bunch of Epicureans and Stoic philosophers. Philosophers. Them. <laughs> Super califragilistic. I can say that, but philosophers, there we go. <laughs> Who are they? What did they believe? And once again, do these kinds of people exist in our world today? Epicureans, here's what they believed. Believe that the universe consisted of atoms and life began when all these atoms randomly came together and life ends when they break apart. There's no afterlife. Are you starting to sense there's a particular religious belief out there that sounds similar to that? Let me go on. Because life is random, orderless, chaotic collusion of atoms, humans must use their free will to shape the world to suit themselves. And the Epicureans' philosophy or chief goal for living is to attain the maximum amount of pleasure, minimum amount of pain, because after all, you live once, so if it feels good, just do it. Sound familiar at all? What philosophies or religions have that kind of understanding or belief? Humanism. Humanism. Scientology. Scientology. Atheists. And out of atheism with birth, evolutionism. Let's recognize that evolutionism is a religion in itself, not just a theory. And so we have that kind of people, groups of people, teachings in our world today that are very similar to the Epicureans. And Paul was about to address them as well. Maybe out of ignorance and unbelief, just like he was as well. I love chatting with atheists and evolutionists. Great conversations. Yes, okay. <laughs> it's not in my notes, so this is a tangent, okay? <laughs> One time I was in university, studied at York University for my undergrad in economics. All I remember is supply equals demand, right? Um, <clears throat> and uh, I was a new Christian, 18 years old. I was at a young adults Bible study group at a church in Scarborough, and um, I was asked to lead one of the Bible studies. So there was this uh, peer of mine that was also a student at York University that was also Christian, and I just kind of like my first time leading a Bible study. Like, how nervous would I feel? And I was talking with her about the scripture passage and what I'm talking about and getting some insight from her and thoughts from her as I'm preparing this Bible study. And there was two young men that were playing ping pong. Just about, it was a small common room, maybe no more than 20 feet away from me. And as I'm talking with her, just having a good conversation, all of a sudden... Like they, I just heard these two men slam their paddles on the ping pong table. They're rushing towards me and pointing their finger right at me while I'm sitting down. They're leaning down, looking at me and going, and, and they use all kinds of expletives. I'm not going to repeat it, obviously. Okay. Are you telling me if I don't believe in this b -b 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 Jesus that I'm going to go to hell? And I said, if you're going to be that blunt with me and talk like that about my Jesus, yes, you are. didn't work. They went off and said, well, then I'll see you in hell. I said, no, I don't think so. <laughs> Lord, may they be in heaven. No, I mean that seriously. Like, I don't know what seed was planted. There is a time for that righteous anger, but 99% of the time, respond with gentleness and respect. 
when people are willing to enter in that dialogue. Oh, well, wouldn't it be awesome if I see these two men in heaven? <laughs> All things are possible with the Lord. So this is the Epicureans and the Stoics. <clears throat> Stoics also believed that the universe consisted of atoms, but it didn't constitute all of reality because they looked at the reality out there that as things exist like love, like truth, like beauty, like logic. And that can't all be described just by this uh, collusion of atoms. So since logic does exist, they said it proves the overarching belief that there is a logic giver. This logic giver was also known as logos, <laughs> wisdom. And this logic giver was recognized by them as a cosmic, supernatural, non-personal mind that caused the universe to operate according to predictable laws and then just let it go. Human spirits are part of the divine, trapped in a material body, the world in itself was God. Trees could be God and all that kind of stuff. And everything was governed by fate. Even God was governed by fate. And death reunited individuals to this cosmic logos. In other words, our soul gets swallowed up into their God. The one religion that believes all of that is Buddhism. And birth out of Buddhism is things like yoga. So many similarities to 1st century Athens and 21st century Kitchener, Waterloo, Ontario, Canada, and the world. <clears throat> How is he going to share the gospel with them? And what can we learn from him? Oh, but there's more. There's more. I love, remember I told you I said I love that verse 21. And all the Athenians and the foreigners who lived there lived there, spent their time doing nothing but talking about and listening to the latest ideas. You know what that sounds like? That sounds like 21st century talk show. Where there's people gathered around a table and they talk about anything and everything, the latest ideas, nothing truly important, they're just venting and stuff like that. Nothing really makes a difference in people's lives in here or for eternity. They just talk about anything and everything and we just listen. First century Athens, they led the way to 21st century talk shows. Since it's clearly obvious that first century and 21st century, so many similarities, how did Paul share the gospel? Remember the golden rule of wise witnessing. Understand what the people are experiencing in here, what's missing in here, what's the deepest need and longing in here that they're not getting from out there. So you can speak into that longing, and now we also learn to do it with gentleness and respect. So let's see what happens next. How does Paul launch into the gospel? How does Paul enter the conversation with them? Verse 22 and 23. Paul then stood up, meeting, stood up in the meeting of the Areopagus and said, People of Athens... I see that in every way you are very religious. For as I walked around and looked carefully at your objects of worship, I even found an altar with the inscription to an unknown God. So you're ignorant, just like Paul was ignorant. That's why he's showing mercy upon them. So you're ignorant of the very thing you worship. And this is what I'm going to proclaim to you. You know, Paul, first thing he could have done when he went up there in front of every one of them, he could have just lambasted them. He was like, guys, are you that foolish? Are you that ignorant? Don't you realize that what you're trying to do in this city is not allowing you to live in freedom? Instead, you're living in the bondage of fear? Does this make sense? All these statues that can't even hear you? He could have just lambasted them over and over again. I mean, after all, Paul should just speak the truth. Sometimes the truth hurts. He could have done that. But if he did that, I wonder how long it would have been before he would have kicked off the stage. Instead, notice how he chooses to start the presentation of the gospel. He praises them. I look around 
and I see, guys, you are so religious. He praises them for their religiosity. And what a great way to start off any conversation when God gives an opportunity to share the gospel with somebody else. Praise them. Praise them, for example, for the good that you see in them. Praise them that they're actually searching and wanting to know the truth. That's just so awesome. Praise them that, you know what, I see in you that you actually do desire to be good and live a good life. That is so awesome. Let it be genuine praise. That builds a bridge. That helps them see that you're actually paying attention to who they are and what they've been sharing. It's so good. Then Paul brings up the statue of the unknown God. See what he's doing? He's pointing to the one thing that they are confused about. He discovers that there is an uncertainty in their life. Something that is missing, and that's what he's going to choose to focus his attention on. Because that's their deepest need. Here we go. Get your pen and paper out or get your phones out if you want to. Four longings that every human being has. And our responsibility is as we're listening to them, as we're talking with them, to try to discern which one of these four is their deepest need. And that's what you're going to be focusing on in your conversation with them. And then eventually through your conversation, then we're going to be addressing all four. It sounds overwhelming, but it's brilliantly simple and beautiful. Four needs, four longings that every person has. Even if they might not define it this way, it is their needs. Number one, origin. Origin. Where did I come from? People want to know that. Even atheists and evolutionists recognize that there's something missing if they truly believe that we came from nothing, by nothing, by no one, just a random accident. They need to know where did we come from. Then secondly, why am I here? What's my purpose for existing? You see, when you're speaking with an atheist and an evolutionist and they just came from nothing, by nothing, for nothing, then they don't know what their purpose is. But people want to know, why am I here? There's got to be something more to life than getting up in the morning, going to work, barely making ends meet, coming home to supper, and then going to sleep and starting all over again. Origin, where did I come from? Purpose, why am I here? then people want to know morality. How do I differentiate between that which is good and that which is evil? People know that intrinsically there is a right and there is a wrong. <clears throat> but how to differentiate? Who determines what is right and what is wrong, what is good and what is evil? Finally, people really want to know this. What's my destiny? Where am I going to end up after I die? So let me give you an example of how this potentially can work. As you're talking with them, and maybe you're discovering that they're really confused about their purpose. Why am I here? You praise them and say, you know what, that's a brilliant question. And I'm honest with that. That's a good question. You can share. I've wrestled with that for a little while as well myself. Until I discovered first and foremost where I came from. Once I discovered where I came from, then my purpose was clearly understood and laid out for me. I don't understand. And he tried to use maybe earthly analogies to help him understand these heavenly beautiful truths. For example, beautiful painting. Maybe it's on the wall, that's a beautiful painting. We recognize that behind that painting must have been an artist that had in his or her mind a reason why they wanted to create that painting. There was a purpose behind that. When we know the artist and who it is, then we have a better understanding of the meaning behind that painting and why he created it. I've discovered 
my God, as revealed in Jesus Christ, that he created me. And I'm his child, loved by him. And I discovered that because of that reality, I have a purpose. And that purpose is to get to know that God who created me and loves me. That purpose is to worship my God. Because he has created me in his beautiful image. I've discovered that I need to love him with all I've got. And in fact, because of my relationship with him, I desire to honor him in the way that I live. And that's where I discover what is right or wrong. The more I get to read about him and his plans for my life, knowing that he created me, he's the all-wise God, he wants what's best for me. So I want to live in a way that is the best way. So it helps me to walk through life with a clear conscience. And you know what? What's really beautiful about my God? is that he doesn't want to have a relationship with me just now for the 60, 70, 80 years I'm here on this earth. But he wants to have a relationship with me for eternity in a place called heaven. And that's why Jesus died and rose again. And I know I'm going to have that relationship with him forever and ever, that even when I die, I'm just going from here to there. There's the gospel in what, a minute and a half. You can do it as you want, as you want to present it, but you focus, you bring it back, you always, if, if they're struggling with morality, if they're struggling with destiny, you bring it back to origin, and you go through origin, meaning, morality and destiny. It starts with origin. If you don't get Genesis 1 right, and Genesis 2 right, then everything else is wrong. And guess what Paul did in the way he presented the truth to the Athenians? He followed that pattern. Acts 17, look at verse 24 and 25. The God who made the world and everything in it is a Lord of heaven and earth and does not live in temples built by human hands. He is not served by human hands as if he needed anything. Rather, he himself gives everyone life and breath and everything else. Origin. We're created by God. He gave us our life and breath. We live because of him. Origin comes from an all-powerful God who breathed his life into us. Then verse 26 and 27 See if he tackles our meaning, our purpose, our reason for existing. From one man he made all the nations that they should inhabit the whole earth. And he marked out their appointed times in history and the boundaries of their lands. God did this so they would seek him and perhaps reach out for him and find him, though he's not far from any one of us. Purpose for living? To search after God, to seek after God and build that beautiful relationship with him. And also he gave us boundaries to live in. So live in those boundaries with great productivity and meaning is given by that fact that we are living at an appointed time in life that he appointed. It's beautiful. Then verse 28 to 30, For in him we live and move and have our being, as some of your own poets have said, we are his offspring. Therefore, since we are God's offspring, we should not think the divine being is like gold or silver or stone, an image made by human design and skill. In the past, God overlooked such ignorance, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent. Morality, since we are his children, as children, we should ought to live in a way that honors the values and the ways that our Father wants us to live, because he knows what's best for us, his children. And if we've intentionally dishonored the name of God, then he calls us to repent, to turn our life around and have a life that honors him. Morality was tackled there, and then destiny. For he has set a day when he will judge the world with justice by the man he has appointed. He has given proof of this to everyone by raising him from the dead. We too will be resurrected with Jesus Christ and to live with him forever if we believe in Jesus as our Savior and as our Lord. Paul was absolutely brilliant in the way he observed 
what was going on in society, understood their deepest longing and need, focused on that, and then presented the whole gospel message by addressing the longing that every human being has, origin and meaning, purpose for life, morality, and our destiny. This Wednesday is going to be Priority Wednesday, the last Wednesday of the month where we encourage all of us to pray and fast together. And then we're inviting you to come back here at 5.30, just before supper time, right after work, after school, come on over here at 5.30. And we're going to spend some time praying together. If there's a little bit more people, if there's like a dozen or 15 people or whatever, we might break off into two smaller groups. And we're going to pray together. And every month there's a focus. And folks, based on what we've just learned from Paul and for this encounter in Athens, the focus once again, we've done this before and I want to keep doing it again, because folks, I've told you this before, based on what we're seeing going on in our world today, we are barreling towards Christ's return. And I don't know about you, but I want as many people that I know to be saved. I want to be given an opportunity to be able to share the gospel with them as summer is coming and the warmer weather is coming, as I meet my neighbors, that I would have discernment by the Holy Spirit to know what their greatest need is and be able to share the gospel with them. They'd be open to receiving it. So this Wednesday, we're going to be praying. We're going to be praying for maybe co-workers, people that are in our neighborhood, around our neighborhood, people you know, loved ones that you know, that maybe are not saved yet, don't believe yet. Even if you're watching online, you could do that. You can do it yourself online, at home, if you live in around the city, feel free to join us at 5.30 this Wednesday for a time of prayer. I want us to pray and fast, pleading before the Lord with thanksgiving in our hearts to be given opportunities to share the gospel so that many would believe. Now in Athens, many believed, but some didn't, and that's the reality. But it shouldn't stop us from having a burning passion desire to share the gospel. Will we do that together on Wednesday, praying and fasting? For God will make a way for us to enter into people's lives and speak to them the truth. And God's promise, he is the promise maker, and God's promise, he says, he doesn't desire anyone to perish, but all to come to know Jesus, Savior, and Lord. And if you're here this morning, you've not made that decision yet. If you're watching online, you've not made that decision yet. And those four things, you go, yeah, you know, I never thought about my origin or my purpose, my destiny. And what I just shared about who Jesus is makes sense to you. You may not understand everything. Folks, I've learned under double PhDs. They're still learning. <laughs> we all can learn more. The brilliancy of the gospel is easy enough for a child to understand the main message, but deep enough and profound enough that double, triple PhDs could spend hours and years still learning something new. So don't wait to try to understand everything. Go, okay, then I'll believe. No. Do you believe that Jesus died and rose again? Do you believe that he did it to forgive us of our sins? Do you believe that he did it so we can have a right relationship with God now and forever? Do you believe that you have sinned, you've done things that are wrong, that you feel guilty about, but God wants to set you free from that guilt? Then choose today to believe in Jesus Christ as your Savior and Lord. And we'll grow together in our beautiful relationship with him. Make that decision today. And please let us know about it. Let anyone here that you know know about it. You made that decision. If you're online, send me an email. Let me know about it. Father, thank you so much for this, your beautiful message. Thank you so much for what we've learned from the Apostle Paul and what we've been learning through the whole book of Acts. And Father, Son, Holy Spirit, give us, give us opportunities to be able to share the gospel with others clearly. May we not be afraid and when we feel a little bit nervous in that moment, we say a little prayer, Lord, help me, and trust that you're going to help. And with confidence, we can share the truth with gentleness and respect and with love. Oh, Father, we know the day of your son's return is drawing near. And I have loved ones in my life that don't know you as Savior and Lord yet. We've talked with them about it. We've planted seeds I pray you would help those seeds to grow. And if there's more opportunities you can give me to speak to their hearts and minds, give it to me. 
my neighbors and people here, Father. They're thinking of people they know right now. That they'd love to be able to have an opportunity to share the gospel with. Even people that might get on their nerves. <laughs> they still, you still died for them. And this Wednesday when we pray and fast, we anticipate your great answers. In Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. If everybody would like to rise.